Great, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Clay Lloyd. I work at HUD as a Community Planning Development Specialist. And I wanted to welcome everyone to the meeting today. We're excited to have you. Uh, we're excited to have our grantee participants uh, be able to get uh, involved and engage with uh, some HUD experts on lead-based paint regulations. Um, before this meeting, this webinar starts, I just wanted to um, mention one item of housekeeping, which is um, an update on our uh, problem-solving clinic. The 2020 problem-solving clinic uh, has now been uh, officially canceled, and we've set up a 2021 problem-solving clinic uh, for March of 2021 in Chicago. So the update one more time is the 2020 Problem Solving Clinic with abundance of caution uh, has now been canceled and we're focusing now on the 2021 Problem Solving Clinic on the same month at the same location. Uh, and to go along with that uh, update, we just wanna point out that uh, the way that we're hoping to best engage and support you guys is through these webinar series for 2020. So uh, if you haven't already, if you found this webinar uh, through an email, please go to the HUD Exchange website uh, where you can get updates on both the problem solving clinic and future webinar series that we're gonna be posting throughout the year. Also, if you have any other questions regarding the problem solving clinic, you can always email uh, HUD DRSI's uh, email address, which is DRSI policy unit at HUD.gov. And with that, I'll send it over to Chris. Thanks, Clay. We're glad everybody's here with us today. Uh, my name is Chris Richmond. I've, uh, I work for ICF and I have been working in the community development world for over 20 years now. And my very first project when I came to ICF was uh, helping to implement the lead safe housing rule uh, back in 1999. So I'm gonna be manning the Q&A box. That's the one that Nicole told you about. If you have any questions uh, about the content, you wanna go to that top blue area on your screen and click on that Q&A and type in your question. And we're gonna try to answer them today. If not, uh, somebody will get back to you uh, after the session about that. Today, I am joined uh, by Clay Lloyd, you just heard Clay. Clay is stationed uh, in the Washington DC HUD office. Uh, he uh, works in Disaster Recovery and Special Issues Division, um, and he works in the CDG, CDBG DR policy for the division. And then I'm also joined um, by Karen Griego. Karen works for HUD's Office of Lead Safe Hazard Control and Healthy Homes as a Healthy Homes representative. So she, Karen has spent over two decades uh, with the department working with housing and health stakeholders to realize the office's mission, which is to help all Americans, but especially children and other vulnerable populations in low-income households reach their full potential by making homes safe and healthy. So we're getting a lot of really good information today uh, from both Clay and Karen. Uh, just to let everybody know what we're gonna be trying to accomplish today, uh, we wanna make sure um, the goal, one of the goals is that you actually understand um, the harmful effects of lead uh, to children and adults, that you are actually going to be um, gaining an understanding of the federal lead paint regulations and how they apply uh, to disaster recovery rehab programs. We're gonna look a, a little bit at some of um, the documentation and help you be able to assess the quality of that documentation. And lastly, uh, we'll identify a couple of resources um, for use and reference. And I know Clay had uh, mentioned uh, an email address um, for CDBG DR. Um, that's actually listed on the last slide. So if you missed that, um, it is listed on the last slide at the end of the session. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Clay. Clay, you wanna Go over the first couple of slides for us. Great, yeah, if you could move to the next slide, that'd be awesome. Okay. Great, so uh, once again, my name's Clay Lloyd. I work at HUD. Uh, I work in the Disaster Recovery and Special Issues Division on the Disaster Recovery uh, CDBG DR grants. 
you can go to the next slide here. Okay, here we go. Um, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble moving to the next slide. There we go, great. So uh, the idea behind this webinar series is uh, to help our disaster recovery grantees, uh, the participants on the line, uh, hear a little bit more about lead paint, lead paint, paint disclosure and the documentation required uh, for the types of programs you might be setting up uh, and running. And uh, we're hoping that this will allow you to increase your understanding of what you need to do, uh, your compliance with the requirements, documentation they might need in hand. Uh, the types of programs that we want you to keep in the back of your mind are housing rehabilitation, uh, buyouts, both the demolition and the relocation side. Those are all dealing with houses that might have been built prior to 1978, which may contain lead paste paint and therefore would make you uh, subject to these uh, lead based housing regulations. You can go to the next slide. Great. So the other reason why we brought it up is that in some of our conversations with our grantees, we found that um, compliance with the regulations and requirements wasn't complete. And so in order to get out of noncompliance, we're hoping that we provide you um, an example of how to go through and make sure that not only that you're doing the proper work, but you may already be doing it um, and you just didn't properly document that you've already done it. So we want you to keep those two in the back of your mind uh, just to make sure that as you execute these programs properly, you also are able to document and tell the story of how you met compliance for uh, lead based paint uh, regulations. Uh, the uh, couple of reasons for this and why we're focusing on lead is, to, uh, is for the health of our occupants, rehab workers, and beneficiaries from the program. And we also want to make sure that we're avoiding any legal issues that might come up from not following these regulations. And with that, I'd love to hand it off to Karen, uh, who is our HUD expert on lead-based paint. Karen, I think Karen, you might be on mute. Okay, I think I'm good now. <laughs> Appreciate that. Anyhow, uh, welcome to our webinar, and we really do thank you for your time and attention um, to this topic today, and we realize that it isn't sometimes an easy regulation to get through. So I hope to provide you with enough information and resources um, with which you can move forth and either be thinking about your policies and procedures that you have in place presently or be thinking about ways and how or where you might need to plug some gaps or completely change a particular procedure or what have you. So please keep in mind um, those policies and procedures that you follow um, during this webinar and our discussion uh, to basically point out or pick out some of the areas within your lead-based paint regulatory requirements um, in your policies and procedures that may need to be modified or up upgraded, if you will. So let's start off with defining the problem. Uh, most of you are at least cursorily aware that lead is a naturally occurring element in the crust of our earth. It's fairly ubiquitous within our, our urban and in some cases uh, rural environments it can be found in the air, in the soil, in water, and inside our homes. In the past, as you know, we have used leaded gasoline um, and it is uh, being manufactured still. It can be found in certain industrial facilities, um, in lead mines and the outputs of those uh, activities. 
in our homes, we have lead-based paint in some cases in pre-1978 properties. It can be found in a variety of other products like ceramics, the solder in, in our plumbing, um, in batteries in our cars, in ammunition, and even in some cosmetics, um, especially some that are imported from out of the country. We are most interested in protecting children. And the reason why we're so adamant about protecting children under six is because they have most of the, uh, they ingest and inhale lead paint at a greater rate than perhaps most human or adults do, although there are health effects on uh, from exposure to lead by adults as well. However, as I mentioned, children under six are the population that we are most concerned and interested in protecting. As you know, children under six spend an awful lot of time crawling around on the floor and putting things in their mouths, including their hands. And if their hands are playing in contaminated soil or contaminated dust on windowsills and other horizontal surfaces, uh, that lead dust in large or small quantities gets directly ingested and into that child's body. Now, several years ago, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention changed their what we call trigger level of blood lead level. Um, and the CDC now recommends, and HUD has incorporated that recommendation or trigger level into its lead safe housing rule, um, that children, when they have a blood lead level of five micrograms per deciliter or higher, that is a trigger for some kind of a action, reaction, or response. So as I mentioned, everyone's basically at risk of lead in their environment if it's inhaled or ingested. And as I mentioned, children under six are the primary target um, because kids absorb more lead than us adults do, and their brains and nervous systems are the most sensitive to the effects. It is a neurotoxin, lead, and it is completely preventable, an elevated blood lead level is. Um, <clears throat> some of you may or may not realize that elevated blood lead level, uh, levels in pregnant women can also uh, pass to the baby, and that exposure um, can be detrimental to that developing baby. We are also concerned with workers such as construction workers, folks doing rehabilitation in the jobs that we pay for um, and elsewhere and in certain industrial fields, they are and could be uh, exposing their families and young children at home when they do not take certain precautions with changing their clothes or washing up. So basically they take home the lead on their clothing and other items and expose their family and children to those dangers. Okay, so the federal lead regulations that we're going to focus on today are HUDs and EPAs. Now you notice some orange uh, arrows on the slides, and those arrows represent where HUD and EPA's regulations kind of intersect. For instance, the lead disclosure rule, HUD and EPA basically have the same rule, and we both enforce that lead disclosure rule jointly. Now, as far as the lead safe housing rule is concerned, many subparts of HUD's regulations at 24 CFR 35 incorporate um, elements of EPA's 
lead-based paint activities rule, and the renovation, repair, and painting rule. You'll notice a little caption at the bottom of this, this slide um, identifying some recent changes in EPA's uh, rule that went into effect in January of this year, and I will go over what that change means and how it may impact um, at least some of your programs presently. So, again, these are the three uh, federal lead regulations that we'll be spending our time today discussing. First being the lead disclosure rule. If you bought, sold, uh, or, or rented a pre-1978 uh, house um, or apartment built unit since March of 1996, you probably um, should have, or maybe you did, hopefully, <laughs> uh, executed a disclosure. Um, and that is receipt of um, a inform informational pamphlet as well as acknowledgement of receipt of that pamphlet and um, any known uh, lead-based paint on that particular property. So disclosure's been around for a long time. Similarly, the HUD uh, lead safe housing rule applies also to pre-1978 housing units, and that's been around since September of 2000. We did make amendments as I mentioned before, um, to uh, reduce the trigger level of an elevated blood lead level, uh, basically from 20 micrograms per deciliter to five to match uh, CDC's response level. Finally, we'll be talking about EPA's renovation, repair, and painting rule. This rule applies to all pre-1978 residential uh, housing and including child-occupied facilities such as schools and daycares, um, regardless of the source of funding, basically. And this rule became effective um, in 2010. So again, that's, this rule has been around for a while as well. So I'd like to, to think of the lead safe housing rule in a series of, of steps. Um, disclosure rule is set aside, and I'll tell you why in just a minute, but essentially um, the steps involved in compliance, in the compliance process of the lead safe housing rule involves evaluating lead-based paint on the property, either through a visual assessment in some cases um, a lead-based paint risk assessment and paint testing um, or a lead-based paint inspection. Naturally, following that evaluation, if there is lead-based paint and lead-based paint hazards, then we figure out, well, how are we going to treat those hazards? Um, either through some kind of paint stabilization for a small job maybe some temporary means to control those hazards, such as interim control methods, or uh, in larger jobs, we're talking about hazard abatement. So basically eliminating all of those hazards on a more permanent basis. And in all cases, we're requiring a clearance. And again, we'll go into some more details on each of these steps um, coming right up. And lastly, um, there are a couple of points in, within and at the end of all of these steps where there's a notification requirement to, to tenants. And we'll take a look at what that, what that means and how to perform that. So let's dive into the lead disclosure rule. As I mentioned before, this rule applies to almost all pre-1978 housing for sale and for lease or rental. Um, the owner or lessor provides this pamphlet, protect your family from lead in your home. There's also provision of a warning statement either in the sales contract or the lease, lease agreement or um, rental agreement. The owner or lessor 
uh, well, the property owner is required to disclose any and all known information about lead-based paint. And one thing I want you to note and keep in mind, and you might want to take a, take a little pen to paper at this point, um, is that when we get into the paint evaluations and clearance and so forth, um, property owners are going to get copies of notification of the uh, results of paint testing and of clearance and the type of work performed. The owner in, that, in those cases of those pre-1978 properties will be required to disclose that information when or if they decide to sell or lease that property to other people in the future. And in all cases, disclosure, again, when the property is being sold or rented, disclosure must be completed before any contract is signed. Occasionally when EPA and HUD folks in my division um, go out and perform enforcement or audit work or monitoring, we see lots of times old, outdated, obsolete notifications such as this um, and similar kinds of material in the uh, in project files or in the sales contract files, leasing contract files. If you have these, if you are using these, please discard them. They are obsolete. Now, this is a basic, uh, albeit small and difficult to read, I just want you to know that there are two different kinds of disclosure forms. One is for leasing and one is for sale. And the reason for the difference is for a property that is for sale, the buyer is afforded an option to get that uh, unit or home tested. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we move forward. However, if, again, if the property is being assisted with disaster recovery funds for rehabilitation um, in the future, that property owner sells that property or leases that property out, um, they are on the hook for providing uh, known information about lead-based paint to those prospective buyers and lessers, lessees, pardon me. Okay, so let's go ahead and dive on into the Let's Safe Housing Rule. So you notice that disclosure of known lead-based paint that we talked about previously said nothing about the requirement to test or abate or treat, right? It's basically a requirement that pre-19, property owners of pre-1978 housing disclose what they know about lead-based paint to the prospective buyer or lessee. Now, the Lead Safe Housing Rule, on the other hand, provides for a much stronger or more protective approach to primary prevention, and that is protecting children in assisted target housing um, from number one, either obtaining or somehow being exposed to lead and lead-based paint hazards such as dust and soil and paint chips, um, and performing work on those units in a lead-safe fashion by credentialed and trained professionals. Okay, now as, as much as it is important to understand the steps to complying with the Lead Safe Housing Rule, it's also very valuable to thoroughly understand the exemptions or when do you not have to comply with the Lead Safe Housing Rule. Again, 
every decision you make, every every step you take in the Lead Safe Housing Rule requires some form of documentation, right? So, for instance, if and when HUD monitors your grant program and particularly um, rehab files, um, files or properties that you have used disaster recovery funds to rehabilitate, we're going to be looking for some kind of documentation in your files that demonstrate that you have made a conscious decision and taken means and measures to um, decide whether or not the Let's Safe Housing Rule applies. So let's go over what those exemptions are. If the property is constructed after January 1, 1978, the Let's Safe Housing Rule does not apply. Very simple. Most zero bedroom units, or what we call SROs, and they could be dormitory rooms and the like, um, unless there is a child under six living in that zero bedroom unit, it is exempt from the Let's Safe Housing Rule. Housing exclusively designated for the elderly or persons with disabilities are exempt. Now, put a note here by exclusively designated for these populations. We are talking about um, properties where there is some kind of legal uh, requirement that only uh, seniors may live there or folks with disabilities. Um, are allowed to reside in a particular property. It isn't, it does not apply, this exemption does not apply to a single family owner occupied home that happens to be owned and occupied by an elderly person or a person with disabilities. So please understand that distinction. Also exempt are properties found to be lead free. Now in order to be be considered lead free, thus exempt from the lead safe housing rule, you must have had, or the property owner must have a thorough lead-based paint inspection where all lead-based paint has been identified and either removed or it doesn't exist. Um, and if it was found initially and removed and the clearance of that um, rehabilitated property says no lead-based paint exists on that property, then um, for future reference, that property is thus lead-based paint free and not, and the Let's Safe Housing Rule does not apply. And oh, by the way, lead-free properties are also exempt from the lead disclosure rule. Next, an unoccupied residential pre-1978 property that is slated for demolition, provided that it remains unoccupied until demolition occurs. Rehabilitation jobs that do not disturb any painted surfaces on that property are exempt. How would we, how would we know that? If I were looking at a project file, I would be looking at the specs. I would be looking at pictures. Um, before and after, probably, if you take them. Um, my recommendation is you do. Um, so there should be some uh, record of decision and some records of um, the specifications for the rehabilitation work, and thus um, we can actually tell from the rehab specifications whether or not paint would be disturbed, potentially. Now, last here on this list is the emergency actions. And emergency actions that are necessary to protect life, health, and safety, or protect from further damage to the structure um, are exempt as well. Now, this exemption does not apply to rehabilitation or restoration of such damaged property, okay? 
also a couple of other uh, exemptions to consider. Rehabilitation that doesn't disturb a, a painted surface. Um, and also, lastly, safe work practices are not required when maintenance, for instance, or hazard reduction activities don't disturb painted surfaces uh, that total more than de minimis levels. And I'm sure you're aware of, when you're thinking in your mind, how much is two square feet per interior space isn't very much, okay? And by the way, these are small jobs, less than $5,000, and we're gonna talk about why that investment threshold makes a difference in how you address lead-based paint in a property. So I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the exemption uh, discussion that we would like to see that you have actually deliberately decided whether or not the Let's Safe Housing Rule applies to a particular um, project. And the way you do that is by utilizing some resources that HUD has available to you. Now you don't have to use this, this form um, as it is but something like it might be helpful to, to you, to your um, project managers, your rehab specialists, et cetera. Um, and towards the end, where we show you where all of the resources can be found, um, it's very easily downloadable and um, can be made part of your policies and procedures. Karen, I just wanted to give you a time check to let you know we, we have about 30 minutes left. Thank you. Sure. So the Lead Safe Housing Rule is um, the one rule within the lead regulations, federal lead regulations, that requires uh, a lot of documentation, as you might have guessed. So we're talking about credentials, certifications, trainings of those folks that are performing abatement or interim controls. Um, testing those properties for hazards, um, abatement reports, um, clearance reports, and the like. And U.S. program uh, administrators are required to keep all of these documents and documentation available for at least three years. We like to say that actual re record keeping should be for the life of the building. Uh, particularly for owners, they should be told and um, educated on record keeping, right? For purposes of disclosure, for purposes of future work that might be done on that, that home. If, for instance, all of the lead-based paint hasn't been removed as a, as a result of your rehab project, um, it's important that they understand and know where the lead-based paint exists and be able to articulate it to the next uh, buyers or renters. Okay, this is a, a really quick snapshot of how the lead safe housing rule is um, sort of distributed, if you will, or uh, codified. And it basically follows certain kinds of activities, right? So whereas the general requirements and definitions, as you might guess, um, applies to all federally assisted um, activities. There are other subparts within the regulation that only apply to certain kinds of activities. And we are going to talk about subpart J. That is our main focus of this discussion today is subpart J. Now, as you can see, there are other subparts that may apply to other types of programs or projects that you all are funding and administering with your DR um, awards. Today, we are going to stick to talking about subpart J. It's possible that if we have enough interest and time in the future, we can cover um, some of the other uh, applicable subparts in future webinars. Okay, 
I kind of led you to uh, to believe that there are levels of uh, protection um, within Subpart J of the Lead Safe Housing Rule, and that goes by the amount of assistance that is provided to a particular project. Essentially, what we're talking about is three different levels of protection. So as you might imagine, the greater the investment, the greater the standard of care. And as you can see from this, this Reader's Digest, if you will, uh, summary, if it's a very small job, for instance, less than or equal to $5,000, the type of lead evaluation that is required is basically paint testing the surfaces that you're going to disturb um, as a result of that, that rehab job. Now, looking further, if the hard costs of rehabilitation exceed $5,000 up to an over 25, I'm sorry, up to $25,000, the requirement for evaluating lead hazards is basically paint testing, so testing the surfaces to be disturbed, and a lead-based paint risk assessment. And I do have a slide that talks about the difference between a risk assessment and an inspection as we move forward. So I just wanted to, to give you this um, sort of uh, very high-level summary of Number one, the steps, right? So this is a sequential kind of, of graph or chart, as well as the requirement for hazard reduction, um, options that might apply, um, evaluation of lead hazards, et cetera. Now, a moment you've been waiting for. I'm aware of the uh, DR funds being used to reimburse property owners for work that they performed on their properties um, pre-application. So they are actually asking for reimbursement of those costs. Um, and I also have to uh, say that this is a tricky um, scenario here, and this CPD Notice 15-07 goes into uh, quite a bit more detail than I have here, but nonetheless, um, that lead screening worksheet would probably come in pretty darn handy, um, assessing whether or not the property itself is exempt or the activities that the um, owner might wish to have reimbursed um, may it just may be exempt from the lead safe housing rule, and you would have to uh, document that. In other, in other cases, the uh, property owner would need to provide you with um, the evaluation of lead-based paint, um, the kind of work that was done to remove the uh, hazards in the lead-based paint, and a clearance report. I don't know about you, but I haven't seen very many um, uh, folks in the private world um, going that length unless their state or local governments require it. So here's an example from the Texas General Land Office. Their policy and procedure basically says that if a property owner is unable to provide evidence of abatement and third-party clearance, um, they just simply do not reimburse. Now, that is for the uh, reimbursement portion. Now, the prospective um, requirement is basically following the lead safe housing rule. In other words, the property owner is now coming to you as a DR administrator um, requesting or applying for funds to rehabilitate or restore the property. The lead safe housing rule obviously kicks in um, if it's a pre-1978 ha house and 
uh, none of the other exemptions that we talked about previously apply. Okay. So this is a busy slide. What I do want you to remember and understand out of this is the difference between a lead-based paint inspection, a risk assessment, and a visual assessment. Now, in our situation um, where paint testing or a risk assessment and paint testing is required of a pre-1978 proposed rehab project, um, that risk assessment has to be performed by a certified and accredited uh, lead-based paint risk assessor. In some cases, the risk assessor may also be um, credentialed in a lead-based paint inspection. So what you need to know and take a note is when you're procuring qualified contractors or vendors to perform this evaluation, be clear and be deliberate in how you write that um, request for proposal or request for um, uh, assistance, right? They're the vendor, uh, the vendors that you have uh, available to you need to know what your expectation is with relation to lead safe housing rule. So a risk assessor, a risk assessment identifies lead-based paint and lead-based paint hazards through sampling. Paint sampling is not paint chips. Paint sampling is the risk assessor uses his or her XRF. Um, that is a very specialized, expensive machine to essentially test the surface all the way through to the substrate to identify whether or not there's lead-based paint in any of those layers of paint on that sample area. The risk assessor also takes dust samples of floors, windowsills. The risk assessor also takes samples of bare soil on the property, particularly around the drip line of the house, if there's bare soil there, and play areas. Now, the report that is uh, written and provided to the property owner and you as the uh, DR administrator will identify um, lots of different things, right? So a chain of custody of all of the samples of dust and soil, um, a full list of uh, areas and uh, XRF samples and the results, um, and also a summary, that is your the number one go-to area of the report um, is the summary. The summary will tell you, or should tell you, where all of the lead-based paint hazards exist on that property, as well as various options to control or eliminate those hazards. So that is the beauty uh, of a risk assessment. A lead-based paint inspection, on the other hand, um, is essentially a surface-by-surface -surface test with the XRF on all painted surfaces inside and outside um, and other appurtenances on the property, like play equipment, garages, outbuildings, and so forth. They don't usually um, include sampling of dust or soil or water or anything else unless you specifically ask for it. Um, but as you remember, recall from the, one of the prior charts, uh, most of the time paint testing of surfaces to be disturbed by the rehab job as well as the normal risk assessment procedure, um, that should be covered in, uh, in a report. And that is the type of activity that you would be um, identifying when you go out for your request for proposal or request for bids for that vendor. Okay. Now, uh, one of the prior slides, I mentioned that um, there are some new EPA 
amendments to their lead uh, regulations, and that has to do with risk assessment and the level of lead in floors and sills and bare soil um, that exceed a certain threshold. Now, what I want to say is that uh, these EPA dust hazard standards became effective on January 6, 2020 for states that EPA runs their programs. There are other states like Texas, like California, Washington, Oregon, um, and a host of other states where the EPA has uh, basically uh, accepted um, regulations from those states to run their own accreditation and certification program. And so the states in those cases basically do EPA's job for them and uh, provide uh, for accreditation, training, and licensing of abatement super lead-based paint abatement supervisors, workers, risk assessors, and inspectors. Now, for those states, this dust hazard standard um, does not become effective um, for two years or earlier when those states amend their state lead laws to incorporate these uh, new standards. So, Obviously, it's important to know if you're um, in a conducting um, disaster recovery rehab jobs in an EPA state or not. These are the old EPA dust uh, standards that are, at least for now, um, still applies in those state-run uh, lead programs. And until and unless these, the state lead laws uh, amend, are amended and adopt the new EPA standard, um, that it, the old standards automatically expire January 6th of 22. So again, um, know whether or not your state is an EPA um, authorized state or a state run um, uh, program. All right, this is just a quick picture of uh, one kind of XRF device and a lot of um, uh, pictorial uh, explanations on how the XRF works and things that I, <laughs> frankly, I uh, I'm not uh, an, an expert on myself, but basically know the the gist of how an XRF works. So if you're interested in um, seeing how it works in in real life and or um, how it works, um, there are resources for you to fig to find that in information. Now you might be asking you yourselves, well, okay, that's fine. How do I locate a certified lead-based paint inspector or risk assessor. And fortunately, EPA does have a way and means of identifying and finding um, risk assessor abatement contractors and those kinds of firms. And this is the website that you can um, plug in and find who, is, who out there is certified and accredited to perform this type of work. Now, it's, in some cases, it isn't an exhaustive uh, list of folks that are certified. Um, and in some cases, there's a lot more that are uh, certified and either not on the list or not working and on the list. So I just uh, kind of put that uh, notation out there for your information. Um, word of mouth is always good. Um, uh, if, you, if you live in a state where the state runs its own um, accreditation and uh, 
training and accreditation uh, program for abatement and uh, risk assessor inspectors, um, you would be able to, to probably call the state um, health department to locate that list. So I'm not going to read this uh, regulation or this citation in the regulation, but just understand and know that um, the HUD Lead Safe Housing Rule incorporates those portions of the EPA regulations that we've been kind of discussing. Um, in this case, the inspections and paid testing requirements. All right. Now. Once evaluation has been performed on your rehab job and you have the results of that risk assessment, you have the report in hand, the requirement is to provide a notice to occupants. Now, a notice to occupants assumes that the uh, risk assessment itself wasn't provided. Now, if it's an owner-occupied property, uh, in most cases, the risk assessor inspector will automatically give a copy or give the original report to the property owner. In any case, if it's an owner-occupied um, property, the owner must get that report for disclosure purposes in the future. If it's a tenant-occupied property, in, in other words, a uh, the property is leased, then this kind of notice, evaluation notice is uh, pertinent to that occupant. Again, owner gets a copy of the full risk assessment report. Karen, just want to give you a 10-minute right. warning. I'm just going to let you know we have okay. about 10 minutes left. Thanks. Okay. So just like there's a, an opportunity to find through the EPA's website who is um, eligible or who is qualified um, to provide those risk assessment uh, uh, activities for you, there's also a way to look up um, who is certified to provide renovation work, right? So it's good to know, number one, who in your community has a risk assessment um, qualification, an abatement worker or supervisor qualification, and now also a certified renovator. We talked a little bit about renovation, repair, and painting rule applies to um, projects that are going to involve interim controls, and this would be where you would look. Now, again, the three levels of protection. For a small job, less than or equal to five grand, again, we talked about pain testing of the surfaces to be disturbed, um, and a renovator to perform pain stabilization. Basically, they're using safe work practices um, to perform that work, some containment, um, there's paperwork, uh, administrative paperwork that that renovator um, should know about and be, um, be performing on their own. Again, EPA is the, or the state, if they're running the renovation, repair, and painting program, um, would have to have those available in cases where they were audited. Now, for an interim control job, now, these are hard, hard costs of rehab above 5,000 and up to and including 25 grand. We're talking about a little bit higher level of protection and work standards, um, these are measures that are designed to reduce on a temporary basis uh, exposure or likely exposure to lead-based paint hazards. Um, these could mean any kinds of uh, repair jobs, um, a repainting job, um, it involves some temporary containment and specialized cleaning in order to pass clearance. On the other hand, if the hard costs of rehabilitation exceed $25,000, uh, hazard abatement, hazard abatement, 
not entire abatement, but hazard abatement. So your risk assessment and paint testing will tell you um, where all those hazards are. You hire an abatement contractor and um, abatement workers to perform that hazard abatement work. Now, take a note on this particular format. Uh, this is not a required um, format for any purposes other than uh, your own record keeping and makes it easier for us monitors to um, go in and check to make sure that the contractor did their job um, by protecting the occupant's belongings and they prepared the work site properly with containment for that particular uh, job. Now, the last step, um, or one of the last steps in the process is clearance. And this is third-party clearance. Typically, it's going to be either the same person or same um, company that performed the uh, risk assessment and pain testing at the beginning of the job. They come back and perform a clearance. And the clearance is going to include a visual assessment of where the work was done, um, and how that contractor left the property, hopefully clean. Um, so the visual assessment is uh, accompanied by dust sampling. And there are usually quite a few of those dust samples um, that are taken, sent to the lab, and hopefully a more or less 24-hour turnaround from the accredited lab um, and uh, that risk assessor will generally either call the contractor or you, the, the property or the administrator of the program, to let you know that um, the unit passed clearance or it didn't. So the lead-based paint hazard reduction portion of that rehab job isn't complete until that clearance um, is passed. So those dust stat, those dust levels um, have to be below the, the thresholds that we kind of talked about um, previously. However, um, the EPA, those du new dust samples are uh, apply at this moment to risk assessment, but aren't ne don't necessarily. Uh, are not necessarily those for um, clearance at this point. That is going to change pretty soon. So um, although those new dust standards, uh, again, apply to risk assessments, um, the old dust standards uh, apply to clearance at this moment. All right, and at the end of that job, the notification that is required to the occupants um, is something like this. Basically outlines and provides some uh, summary information to the occupants about the lead hazard reduction activity that took place and that clearance was achieved. And this format is available on the uh, Lead Rule Compliance Advisor. That is a resource that I have a slide on in a minute. So just to reiterate, um, notification of residents is required following paint testing and the risk assessment within 15 days of, of receipt of that uh, report and 15 days following the clearance. Again, the owner of the property always gets the full lead-based paint testing and risk assessment report, as well as the clearance report for disclosure purposes later on. Um, really quickly, there are a couple of considerations um, that are afforded to you in relation to historic preservation and fair housing. So if the home that you are working on is eligible or or on the National Register of Historic Places, 
Um, you know that the State Historic Preservation Offices don't really like you to change windows and doors and exterior components um, that may affect the historic significance of that home or property. So in this case, you're allowed to, under the Lead Safe Housing Rule, to conduct interim controls on the exterior instead of hazard abatement. So if it makes sense, um, repairing and um, eliminating the lead-based paint from existing windows is preferable to the SHPO than uh, replacement. But if you do do replacement, make sure your consultation is clear and they give and the SHPO gives you um, a, no adverse effect if you're going to replace in kind. So there's uh, additional information on um, historic preservation in uh, this uh, brief 37 from the Advisory Council on um, historic preservation and also in the HUD guidelines. And by the way, HUD writes the operating standards and the how-to um, for purposes of risk assessment, inspection, abatement, um, uh, interim controls, clearance, et cetera, for the industry. This is what is taught in the classes in order for folks to get their um, certifications to do that kind of work. Um, and HUD writes those guidelines. I think I have a slide in here. Now, as far as fair housing, uh, what the fair housing uh, rule is, is that it's unlawful to discriminate in the terms, conditions, or privileges of sale or rental um, of a property based on all kinds of things, including familial status. So what we're talking about here is pre-78 uh, property that uh, a landlord won't rent to a family with children under six because of the age. We do get that. Uh, condition occurring quite frequently. So that is an illegal um, action on the part of the owner or landlord. Okay, quickly on the renovation, repair, and painting rule. Again, this applies regardless of whether it's a federally assisted property or not. This became effective in 2010. Um, it applies to, like I said, uh, pre-1978 residential properties as well as child care facilities and other child-occupied facilities. Um, firms need to be uh, certified by the EPA or the state if they are running the RRP program. Um, they use, uh, you must use certified renovators uh, that are trained and approved by approved training providers. Um, so there's a whole host of um, accredited training providers for the RRP class. It's a one-day class. And there's a hands-on component to it as well. And I do believe uh, a lot of states provide, uh, or training providers provide that uh, training in Spanish, which is very helpful. Um, they are required also to uh, provide this Renovate Right pamphlet. Um, to the occupants before the job starts. If they are found in violation by EPA or the authorized state, um, high civil monetary penalties could be imposed. All right, so documentation requirements at a glance. So evaluation, our first step. Um, copy of the paint testing and risk assessment report. That is the piece of documentation that supports and provides um, evidence that uh, either there's lead-based paint uh, hazards or there are not. Now, as far as the next step, treatment, we're going to be looking at the bid specifications, your RFPs, your RFQs, um, to ensure that you are offering these uh, jobs to qualified either renovators in the case of an interim control job that is over, well, small jobs, $5,000 up to $25,000, or if it's a large job that the hazard abatement work was performed by an abatement contractor and, a, and abatement workers. 
your bid documents should also contain um, information as far as compliance with uh, for abatement and or interim controls depending on the job. Um, if you do not specify uh, your expectations as far as credentials and certifications, often uh, we find the responses to those bids um, exclude the requirement. Um, we're also going to be looking at occupant protection and work site preparation, and that would be evidence usually in the bid docs. There could be pictures as well. And uh, to demonstrate clearance, obviously we have a clearance report, or hopefully not, but a reclearance um, identifying that all of the, the lead dust um, was uh, removed and don't exceed the uh, thresholds set by EPA, and we see the results um, of those dust samplings in uh, those clearance reports. And then naturally we have to look for evidence of did you notify the occupants of the risk assessment results and also of the work itself and when clearance was achieved. So really quickly, um, I referred to a little bit ago um, a reference to the lead rule compliance advisor, and this is it. You'll notice that the um, there is a resources tab on here, and when you click on the resources tab, you'll see all kinds of stuff, including the notification um, forms, worksheets that I uh, had examples of earlier, as well as um, sample bid, bid specs, um, the, what else? Well, you go in there and you'll, you'll see there's a plethora of information. And this is a link to the HUD guidelines um, that I talked about a little bit earlier. And if you're interested, um, and taking a look at the complexities and what your um, lead and construction folks are learning and knowing and hopefully performing, you can reference these uh, HUD guidelines. And a few other links to resources that you will most likely uh, be able to get more information, samples, examples and um, information on lead safe housing rule, lead disclosure rule, et cetera. Okay, I think we can, if we do have time, get to take some questions. Sure, Karen, that was a great job, thank you. Um, we do have time to just do a couple questions and the question that always comes in was about level of assistance and they wanted to explain um, what, what was that level of assistance and was it just the project cost and what's, they weren't quite sure when you showed that chart that had under 5,000, 5 to 25, over 25, like what, where did those numbers come from? What does that actually mean? Gotcha. So the hard costs of rehabilitation that I referenced include construction, uh, permits, associated fees and other project costs regardless of source. Now, on the other hand, costs of site preparation, occupant protection, relocation, interim controls, abatement, clearance, waste handling, all to be done in compliance with the Lead Safe Housing Rule, those costs are not to be included in the hard cost of rehabilitation calculation. There are examples of how to um, calculate hard cost of rehab in the regulation section 35.915 C is in CAT. Now the lead rule compliance advisor also has examples on calculating hard cost of rehabilitation. When you follow the prompts on uh, the rule compliance advisor, you'll see, you'll get to a point where there are some uh, examples of calculating hard cost of rehab. Great, thank you. 
Um, we also got a question in about what if the project fails clearance? Do you, they have to do more work if that happens? Perhaps. So the clearance report will identify where and how clearance failed. Typically a unit fails clearance due to an inadequate containment of their work site or their work area and their cleaning uh, techniques are below standard, right? So in other words, they didn't clean well enough and the dust levels um, exceed clearance levels. So the renovator or abatement contractor um, is then responsible to go back in and address all of those points of failed clearance. And again, the lead hazard control work is complete when that dwelling passes clearance and is safe to reoccupy. Great. We, we also got another question because they sometimes they use CDBG for infrastructure. And so they were asking, do we only need to follow this rule for housing or is infrastructure or any other facilities covered under this rule? Are you able to talk about that? That might be the last question we have for today. Yes, ma'am. Good question. So the lead safe housing rule applies to pre-1978 housing that you're assisting, not facilities or infrastructure improvements or commercial buildings or um, other public facilities. It's strictly limited to housing. Great, thank you. So we do recognize there were a ton of questions that came in and we were not able to get answers out to all of those. So staff will be reviewing those and, and we have your name. So we'll be getting back to you uh, with answers about that. And we will also um, be hosting this webinar um, along with the transcript um, uh, shortly. So I wanna thank everybody for joining us today. Sorry, it ran over a little late, um, but very helpful information. Thank you to Clay and Karen. Uh, for your time and, and presenting this really important information uh, to grantees today for us. So thanks everybody and hopefully you can join